how do you do with transitions in your life? Are you able to make the most of them or do you see them as a challenge that you struggle to overcome? That's what we're going to address on Flourishment today. I'm your host, Tina Yeager. Flourishment is part of the Spark Media Network and can be heard on the Edify app. Today I have with me D. Michael Lindsay. He's the president of Taylor University and the author of Hinge Moments, Making the Most of Life's Transitions and several other books. He's here to talk to us today about making the most of transitions. Welcome, Dr. Lindsay. I am so honored to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for having me on. Glad to be here. So tell the audience why transitions is something that you're passionate about. What brought this to your heart and made you want to write an entire book focusing on this theme? Well, I'm a college president, so I work with uh, students every year, both high school and college students who are thinking about big decisions in their life and facing their own hinge moments, places where their path could go multiple directions. And in the process of that, I began looking for a book that I could recommend to students that they might read as they're exploring possibilities and asking God to guide them. And I just didn't find many things out on the market that I thought would be a good resource. So it was really out of a desire to find something that I decided, well, perhaps I might write about it. I had spent 10 years of my life interviewing senior leaders in all different walks of life. So I went back to look at all those interviews to see if there were insights I might be able to glean from that. And through that process, I wrote Hinge Moments. So from Hinge Moments and the research that you did, did you find a thread of commonality in, among those who were successful at navigating transitions in their lives, including those who are in great positions of power? Because as you may know, transitions are difficult for those of us beyond that college transition as well. Yeah, the project was amazing. I got a chance to interview former presidents uh, Carter and Bush, cabinet secretaries like Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell. 20 of the Fortune 100 CEOs, another 250 senior leaders, heads of every major nonprofit, including the presidents of Harvard, Stanford, and Princeton. So it's an amazing array of interesting people. And across all 550 people I interviewed, I found that when we go through change or transition, there are different stages or phases of that transition. And the folks who succeeded were ones who were able to be attentive as they went through the different stages, but then also to be able to maximize them so that they came out on the other side stronger, better, richer, deeper in their faith. So was this a faith struggle as well as a, an emotional relational struggle for each person that went through these transitions? Absolutely. It's not just a psychological uh, set of transitions we go through, but also spiritual journeys along the way. So as I wrote Hinge Moments, we try to incorporate stories of inspiring faith, but also practical guidance for spiritual disciplines or other practices we can put into our life to help us when we're facing these challenges. It's interesting that you chose such a broad variety of backgrounds and belief systems and values and political mindsets. Why did you choose such a broad sampling of different kinds of people? Well, if you want to learn how to play basketball, it's helpful to watch Michael Jordan. Similarly, if you want to learn how to have a successful life, it's helpful to look at those folks who have uh, turned out pretty okay. And so I interviewed Condoleezza Rice, extraordinary woman, served as National Security Advisor, Secretary of State. But hearing her story, that wasn't what she expected when she was a 14-year-old. She thought she was going to become a classically trained professional concert pianist. But she went to a competition, the Van Cliburn competition, and realized she'd never be as good as some of these other kids who were playing. And it became a hinge moment in her life where she had to decide to do something different. She went to college early, studied at the University of Denver, became interested in the Soviet Union. That in turn led her to pursue graduate studies at Notre Dame, get a PhD in political science. And then she pursued an academic career at Stanford while also continuing her interest in national security issues. That's a classic example of the hundreds of people that I met, and they were able to draw upon both good moments and bad, moments of great triumph and also difficulties and failures. And so I've tried to condense those into hinge moments to be a practical guide for all of us. So we may not become National Security Advisor or Secretary of State, but each of us can find ways to manage and navigate and hopefully flourish even in the midst of some of those challenging moments. So in every transition that you discuss in your work, 
are you looking at a transition as something that is not what we expected, something that might be what we expected, but we still weren't prepared for, and or something that hits us that is absolutely a devastating issue in our lives and changes everything? The book really addresses all three of those. And you're right to say those are different kinds of circumstances. So um, my wife and I might hope and pray that we would be able to have a baby and she gets pregnant and the birth of the child, that's a hinge moment that we were hoping and praying for and excited about. Also, uh, my wife might get a cancer diagnosis that ends up being very serious. That's a hinge moment we didn't expect and we had to sort of respond to. Or it might be that my wife gets a, a job opportunity that we never expected, but it opens up doors of possibility. We have a chance to process it, decide she's gonna go for it. We move to a new city. All three of those hinge moments are things that have different kinds of set of circumstances, but all three of them require us to be able to manage the transition over a long period of time. The key thing in the book that I differentiate is that change is instantaneous. It happens in a moment. Literally within a minute or two, the change occurs. But transition is a gradual process that can take weeks, months, even years to process and to navigate around. So how do we get our soul in a good place to manage transition when we experience change, wherever it may come. How does this have to do with that wonderful gift that God gave us of choice? A lot of people believe that life is what happens to you or life is how you are made, when really it is about how we choose to respond to how we are made and what happens to us. How do all of these transitions revolve around our choice and how to respond to those? Well, I do believe that uh, throughout scripture, we see examples of how God directly intervenes and creates opportunities, but there's always an element where men and women have to respond to the call of God or not. And I think there are consequences in both of those circumstances. So uh, we talk about in the book how there's, you get to a low point when you face a transition called the intersection phase. And I'd say there are moments where God meets us and provides resources and opportunities for us in that very liminal moment. And at the same time, some of it is shaped by decisions that we have made or those around us have made that we have to sort of respond. So there's a, a both and a part where God is at work and a part where we're at work. That is so true. And how would you say that transitions play a role in our growth? Well, there's lots of interesting examples, both in scripture and just around us. So I'll speak personally. Um, so I have my own hinge moment while writing this book in that I sensed God might be calling me to be willing to step down as the president of Gordon College, a position I loved, and I thought I'd be there for the rest of my career. But I was reviewing these interview transcripts. I had done an interview with Bruce Kennedy, the longtime CEO of Alaska Airlines, and I'd long forgotten. But in the interview, he talked about his own decision that after 10 years on the job, it was time to do something different. He faced a hinge moment. And as I read those words on the page, I got butterflies in my stomach thinking, wow, what is, what's going on here? Why am I nervous for him? He made that decision years ago. I realized it was maybe the call of God that I was supposed to respond to. And so uh, through a series of providential circumstances and additional confirmations, I made the decision to go to my board of trustees and tell them, I think God's maybe calling me to do something different. I didn't know what that was. So I gave them uh, six or eight months to find my successor. And meanwhile, I began looking myself. I'm very happy to be a Taylor. It's an amazing university. All of your listeners should send their kids or grandkids to come and study at Taylor. And at the same time, I would say it was not something that was on my radar. And so the Lord really can provide opportunities for us, even when we don't expect it. How long was it between the time you chose to obey God and follow that decision that he had asked you to make to step back from your long-standing, well-loved job and the time when he confirmed your next step. Was there a waiting between those two things? And yeah, how did that absolutely. go? Yeah, it was over a year. Uh, and oh. so it was a long process. I guess the Lord kept getting my attention about um, my being willing to lay down on the altar this job that I love that I had worked really hard for and that I really wanted the rest of my life. But once I got to a place of surrender, and that was probably, that was probably a long eight month process of many different conversations, prayers and confirmations. And then I felt naked and alone because I've now said, I'm not gonna do this job, but I don't know what I'll do next. 
And it probably took about six months for the Lord to give confirmations. A good friend of mine, Arthur Brooks, who was the president of the American Enterprise Institute for a decade, he, he's a very faithful Catholic. And he said, you know, I don't know what you evangelical Protestants do, but we Catholics, we go to mass when we're asking God to guide us. So he encouraged me to do something every day. So my wife and I would take a what we called a discernment walk. And we would walk for anywhere from 10 minutes to two hours, uh, pray aloud, read some scripture, and ask the Lord to guide us in this season. And that was about six months while we were waiting, trying to discern what God would lead us to. And we're so happy. We're, we feel very gratified and confirmed in what we're doing now. But it was quite a journey for us along the way. I love that. That's such a practical piece because what people don't expect when they first hit the transition is how long that transition can be and what they're to do with that struggle in the waiting time. So that is a key piece. And we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, I want to dive into some specific practical things that you can do to navigate a transition in your life and make the most of it. Meet the Christian who married faith with true crime, Lori Morrison. Lori is a person of faith, a private investigator, and the producer of the award-winning podcast, The Unlovely Truth, where faith and true crime intersect. Lori and I would like to invite you to join the True Crime Mission Fields program, a life-changing opportunity exclusively joining Christians who have married faith and true crime. Featuring Chaplain Lori Prather, the products within the True Crime Mission Fields program allow you to connect your passions and skills as Christians with practical service opportunities within the world of true crime. You will begin to serve people in difficult circumstances and have a greater impact in this world than you ever imagined possible. Access your free report Meet the Christian who married faith with true crime and receive up to 70% off of any collection when you use the link in the show notes. And now we're back with Dr. Michael Lindsay, the president of Taylor University, and he's here to share with us how to navigate and make the most of transitions in your life. Dr. D. Michael Lindsay. How would you prescribe for people some steps that they can take in their lives to overcome, navigate, and grow in the process of transitioning through what you're calling hinge moments in their lives? Well, I, every change that happens in our life, we go through a process of transition. And in the book, I lay out seven different uh, phases or stages. But one of the first of those is a sense of anticipation. So I encourage folks that if they are feeling restless in one way or another, to be attentive to that, that that actually might be the Holy Spirit guiding them in one way or another. Sometimes that restlessness comes as we read or as we reflect or we hear a sermon, or sometimes it's in our actual circumstances. And we just think, this is not, I'm not flourishing in this environment. I want to do something different. And I'm wondering, could God lead me in a different way? Or family transitions, we, you know, different family circumstances can occur both uh, maybe getting married or having the birth of a child or the death or a divorce or loss. All of those can be moments where we begin to anticipate what God is doing. And then in the book, I encourage you to slow down and spend some time discerning what God might do. Sabbath keeping is really helpful because that is a way of giving us a chance to rest and reflect. I also think building some systems in our life where there's daily routines where you take stock. So keeping a gratitude journal of three things you're grateful for and asking God to use that to reveal maybe what might be coming next or the next phase or the next step or the next transition. And I also think that eventually we get to this intersection phase where we realize we've got to ch change or transition. And we've got to pay attention to the call of God. All three of those are moments when you can actually experience the Lord's work and friends and uh, family members can be really helpful guides along the way. So I encourage folks to be able to share with a small group of people, maybe what you're feeling on the inside, some of the wrestling you're grappling with, and they can come alongside you and be helpful encouragers and maybe also helpful counselors. Such great tips. And I'm hearing along as a thread through all of these that you need to recognize that a transition is a change, not an end in and of itself. You're not going to have to necessarily be devastated 
by a change. And sometimes people don't make it through transition well because they see it as an end instead of a transition. And that is important. And I'm also hearing you say to pay attention, to listen, to observe, and expect God to show up and, and look for the places where he can show up in these transitions in your life. And I'm also hearing you to say that you need to be intentional about these steps that you've outlined in your book. All of that is absolutely the case. And I think probably one of the key things from my own journey, I can just say, when I made the decision to step away from the presidency at Gordon College, I thought that I was giving up the chance to enjoy a job that I felt very uh, led to pursue and that was very meaningful for me. And in fact, it was a new assignment, but not a, a complete change. So I'm now serving as a university president at Taylor. And I remember telling a friend of mine, you know, when you're a Christian college president of a, a nationally ranked school, it's like you're the quarterback of an NFL team. And there's only 31 other teams you could possibly go to. So it's really difficult to see how God can open up the right door for you to be in the right spot. And yet in God's providence, that's exactly what he did in my life. And if it worked for me, my hunch is that it can work for others as well. Mm -hmm. That is so good. And I'm hearing that that scripture come to mind about unless a kernel of wheat falls to ground and dies, it cannot bring forth fruit. So we need to be willing to sacrifice in this process of serving God and, and obeying his calling in our lives. Yeah, I think that one of the key things for me is that we have to really view our life and our work and our family as gifts of God, but we have to be willing to put those gifts on the altar to God and say, Lord, we want you to do this as you would will. And I think that process of surrender, which takes particular moments in time, but also is cultivated over years of spiritual discipline and practice in our life, that that becomes really the crucible moment where the Lord can open up doors of opportunity we never imagined before. So there is a really key part of sacrifice and service that I think the Lord honors. And I think is also a place where the Lord is glorified. And as a brilliant president of a major university, I know that you would never say don't make goals, but we should hold our goals loosely, right? That's right. You, you, you make your very best plans, but you have to commit them to the Lord because he will guide our steps. Yes. And we put our expectations instead of in our goals and our dreams, we put our expectations in God's goodness. Yeah, it's certainly been true in my life. And out of these 550 people I interviewed, I just saw so many examples of very interesting, amazing people. I'll just share one. Francis Collins, who has been the longest serving director of the National Institutes of Health, but he's an amazing scientist. This is the guy who led the five research teams that mapped the human genome, the most significant scientific discovery of our lifetimes, because it's making cancer treatment be personalized for your particular genetic uh, DNA. Well, Francis Collins experienced a hinge moment as a medical resident at UNC Chapel Hill, where he encountered a older woman who was facing death, but didn't have the kind of panic or fear of her mortality. Instead, she saw it as this is part of the Lord's will in her life. And he was unsettled by that. He'd grown up atheist, didn't see that that was the way to go. But it was her quiet faith and confidence that began to sort of shape his own wonderings, his own questions. And then he began reading the works of C.S. Lewis and others, a two-year journey that eventually led him to place his faith in Jesus Christ. Each of us face those kinds of hinge moments every week, if not every day. And part of it is being attentive and saying, God, how are you at work today? And how can I join you in that important work? Is that what the hinge is about? Because I'm curious as to why you chose that picture of a hinge to describe a transition. Well, listen, a hinge is an engineering marvel because it's this little piece of metal that you put on a door and it holds the door in place. It allows the door that's open to remain open. It allows a door that is closed to remain closed. And yet it can also be the fulcrum by which you open a closed door or you close an open door. I mean, it's just amazing how the Lord can use things in our life to both open up doors of possibility, but also close other things along the pathway. I, I made the allusion to NFL. I learned as a seventh grader, I'm not going to be an NFL quarterback. I just don't have that particular gifting. And yet the Lord can use even that discouragement to realize you're not going to be an NFL quarterback to say, but you're good at school. So maybe you could do something in education. 
all those kinds of ways in which we see how is Lord gifted me and how can I use that in my life? I found that to be true time and again. And so we each face hinge moments along the way that can open up doors of possibility. I'm hearing that we need to ask that question more directly to God. What is it I'm not seeing? If we continue to feel discouraged, that may be the question that we have failed to ask. I think that's right. Part of what you have to do and part of the spiritual disciplines and practices that I encourage in the book is a, a process of just discerning where is God at work and how can you join him in that? And it's it, often... Our prayers are so focused on, God, I want you to do this. I want to do that. Will you open up this? When in fact, it may be as a reorientation to say, okay, God, what is it you're going to do here? And where are you going? And what should I say? How should I respond? Will you really guide me? Will you bring people along my path today that could help, help shape me and open up new doors of possibility? So we're not fighting the flow of the river of the Holy Spirit. We're sailing with him as the power with which we get from one place to the best place. I love that uh, image. There's a um, 20th century theologian named Karl Barth who says that Christian vocation is not like a military assignment where you're stuck there for the rest of your life, but instead he likens it to a journey to new harbors. So you're in a harbor for one season. You maybe flow along that river of the Holy Spirit and it takes you to another harbor and you're there for another season. There's a progressive element where in God's providence, he leads us to the right harbor for just the right season. And that is so true because one transition is not the last transition. We'll go through many of these during the course of our lives. So as you counsel the students in your university, do you prepare them for a lifestyle of navigating all of the transitions to come very well by starting out by learning this one after you graduate? I try to, and you know, I think one of the key things is that when you're 22, you think everything has to be all figured out uh, for your first year out of college. But I relate this story of uh, Dr. C. Everett Koop, who served as Surgeon General um, for the United States under President Reagan and was very involved in the pro-life movement. He was a world-class um, pediatric surgeon whom God really called to a position of greater prominence later in life. I had the chance to interview Dr. Koop when he was 78 and I was a faculty member at Dartmouth. And he talked about how throughout his life, the Lord had sort of led him to different phases. And he said, I don't really believe in retirement. I don't think that's a biblical idea, but I think God calls us to different seasons and different chapters. And so much of what we want to try and do is to be open to that and say, all right, Lord, what can I do today? And how can you prepare me for tomorrow? And human nature is to stay at the same rate of growth, the same comfort zone and not change. Whereas our growth and our best life depends upon us being willing to navigate change. How do we reconcile the difference between what God wants for us to grow and what our human nature is to stay at rest if we're at rest and to stay moving in the same direction if we're moving in that direction? Those scientific principles of physics apply to the psyche as well. Yeah. You know, I used to live in Boston and uh, in New England, they have all of these lobsters. It's very, very common. And uh, I didn't know much about lobsters when I moved to Boston, but I learned they have this hard exoskeleton, which keeps them protected from, um, you know, other animals that would eat them or the elements or different things like that. But every lobster on average will go through 14 different times when they will molt that exoskeleton and they'll be sort of out in the elements for seven to 14 days. In that time period, their body mass will grow. It will double or sometimes triple in size in just those seven to 14 days. Now those happen to be the very same days when they are most vulnerable to predators, when they're out in the elements. They don't have the protection of the hard exoskeleton, but yet that becomes times of real growth. We each go through seasons when we've got the protection we need, we're in settled times, life is not really a lot of challenge or, or difficulties. And then we can also go through those more vulnerable moments when the hard shell has molted, we're out in the elements. And it's what I would call unsettled times when you're more likely to feel sort of that growth and pressure, but it's those very unsettled times in our lives when you don't have the hard shell protecting us that actually God uses it to help us grow and develop. It's how we become the creature that God made us to be. So overcoming that psychological entropy or inertia will require us to meet a challenge or to really seek God's best for our lives more than we seek our own comfort. 
Indeed. And I found that happen time and again. Fantastic. Well, this has been such a wonderful, rich conversation. And I know that your book includes so many examples that are inspiring and extrapolate this so much further. How can people stay connected with you and get in touch with you and get a copy of your amazing written works? Well, I hope that you'll check out Hinge Moments. You can buy wherever you buy books, online or in person. Uh, it's published by InterVarsity Press, and I'm very excited about the book. It makes a great gift, but also is a great resource for other folks. You can also learn more about me. I serve as the Taylor University president, and you can learn all about it on our website, just taylor.edu. Thank you so much, Dr. D. Michael Lindsay, for joining us on Flourishment today. I hope that all of you listening feel richer and stronger and more capable for navigating that next transition in your life. And of course, I also hope that you come back for the next episode of Flourishment. Flourishment is part of the Spark Media Network and can be found on the Edify app.